exponential smoothing is a standard way to produce forecasts across a wide range of domains. It's very simple, often involves a small number of parameters, and can adapt to situations where data are non-stationary. Here, we will focus on the linear specification, also known as additive exponential smoothing models. There's a large range of models that include multiplicative specifications, where components are multiplicatively interacted with each other, and models that mix multiplicative and additive components. These are beyond the scope of what we can cover in this course, but are interesting in their own right. However, when you take a linear specification and you take a log of the original data, this is a simple way to construct what is ultimately a multiplicative model for the level. The main assumption we have here is that we're going to observe data. data. The main assumption we have is that we're going to observe data. Throughout these slides, we assume that we observe data x1 through xt, and we're interested in producing forecasts for xt plus 1, xt plus 2, possibly all the way through xt plus h. The basic model is known as simple exponential smoothing. We've seen this in the course in the context of volatility modeling as an exponentially weighted moving average. We saw this is closely related to a GARCH 1-1 model. Here, the model is defined in terms of the following recursion. On the left-hand side of the equation, we have xt plus 1 given t. That is, the one step ahead forecast given the information at time t. This depends on two things. It depends on the most recent value xt and a weight alpha, and 1 minus alpha times the previous forecast, that is xt plus xt given xt minus 1. We've seen this specification enough to know that we can do recursive substitution, and we can get the expression that x hat t plus 1 given t can be written as alpha xt plus alpha 1 minus alpha xt minus 1 plus alpha 1 minus alpha squared xt minus 2 and so on all the way back to the beginning of the sample. This is the sort of expanded form of the exponentially weighted moving average. Taking this recursion back to the first value, we see that the very first value is obviously x2 given x1, depends on x1, and importantly, it depends on x1 given 0. So this first forecast we don't actually have. So this is known as an initial value, and it's not usually something we can get from the data. In many contexts, it makes sense to set this simply to x1, and in particular, when the sample size is relatively large and alpha is not 1, value has a little impact on the forecast. An alternative is to estimate it along with alpha. Parameters in this model are estimated using least squares. This is not an ordinary least squares model. That is, it has latent values, and so it's not possible to use OLS. However, it's something we can use nonlinear least squares to estimate, and this is standard in any decent statistical software package. To understand where the simple exponential smoothing model comes from, we can actually show that it's related to a data generating process known as an integrated first order moving average. So the integrated MA1 is going to have two components. Technically, this is an ARMA11 with a unit root. We can see that the two components we're going to have are going to be the unit root, xt, the moving average term there, and the coefficient we use in the moving average is minus 1 minus alpha. This is chosen for simplicity because it will allow us to derive the exact same specification we have for the EWMA. To actually see how we get this, what we do is we start with the one step ahead forecast. We know the one step ahead forecast for an MA1 or an ARMA11 is, is going to be xt. Then I'd say plus the moving average term. But of course, we have a minus here. That's just how we've written it. So it's xt minus 1 minus alpha times epsilon t. The other thing we see is that epsilon t, of course, can be written in terms of xt, xt minus 1, and epsilon t minus 1, simply using the fact that we know that xt equals xt minus 1 minus 1 minus alpha epsilon t minus 1 plus epsilon t. So we've just inverted this expression to get an expression for epsilon t. We can then substitute for epsilon t in the original equation. And 
Once we do that and we expand a little bit, we're going to get a few more terms. So of course we're going to get a we get the minus one minus alpha. It's going to show up twice. We then have xt and a minus xt minus one. The minus and minus combine to give us this plus sign here. We then of course have a one minus alpha squared term times epsilon t minus one. We can do some algebra and simplify this a little bit. And the one thing we're going to get out of here that we want is we get alpha times xt. We then can repeat the process for epsilon t minus one using the exact same identity, just backshifting all of the time series observations. And what we can see when we do that is of course we're going to get some additional terms. We're going to get a xt minus one, an xt minus two, and an epsilon t minus two. It comes from the exact same expression we have a couple lines above, only using t minus one, t minus two, and t minus two as the time indices. And with a little rearranging there, we actually get alpha xt, alpha one minus alpha, xt minus one. And then we have two remaining terms, which is one minus alpha squared xt minus two, and one minus alpha cubed, now epsilon t minus two. So if we were to continue this a few more lines, you know, so for example, if I sub in for epsilon t minus two, obviously that's gonna give me three terms. It's gonna give me an xt minus two, an xt minus three, and an epsilon t minus four. This xt minus two term will combine exactly with what I need there to give me the next expression in the, in the recursion, which would be alpha one minus alpha squared xt minus two and that pattern would continue. In fact, we can actually summarize the pattern at the bottom, which is the expectation of xt plus one can be written as alpha times one minus alpha to the power i times xt minus i. We recognize this as just a standard exponentially weighted moving average. The only assumption we needed here was that epsilon zero is zero. Of course, that's probably not true. We, of course, don't really know what epsilon zero is. We don't have data about beyond the beginning of our sample. However, this doesn't matter in two ways. One, it should be mean zero, that we normally assume that this shock is a white noise process with mean zero. So in some sense, you can think of replacing the unobserved value by its expectation. The other sense it doesn't matter, as you can see, as you go back in time, you're getting coefficients that are larger and larger on one minus alpha next to the epsilon terms. So in fact, the epsilon zero term will have a very large power of one minus alpha on it. And so as long as we have the condition that alpha is somewhere, say, between zero and one, in fact, strictly less than one and strictly greater than zero, then this term shouldn't matter as long as the sample size is large. So either one of these are sort of enough justification to sort of say this is going to make a good forecast. But what this, what this slide shows really is that when we use an exponentially weighted moving average, there are at least some models where we actually are making an optimal forecast for, that is models that have a unit root and have an MA1. Of course, there are other models where it, it may work well. It's a tightly parameterized model and it's simple to estimate. And so that's not to say we have to believe that the data are generated by this to use this model, but it gives us a formal justification of, of when we actually be very happy to use simple exponential smoothing. The nice thing about exponentially weighted moving averages, or SES, are that the forecast for any horizon depends only on the one step ahead forecast. So if I want to forecast eight steps ahead, all I need to do is have the one step ahead forecast and they'll be the same value. So as soon as I have one, I have forecast for all horizons. We can actually use the integrated moving average to understand what the prediction interval will look like for this model. So a 95% prediction interval. Here we're actually going to assume, of course, the errors are normal. That's where we get the 1.96. Well, it depends, of course, on sigma, which is the error variance. And then it depends on, on one final term, which is 1 plus h minus 1 times alpha squared in the whole square root of that. So that's gonna show up as the forecast error variance for an integrated MA1. That's where that term comes from. If we wanna actually see that, I've sort of done the derivation for that on the next slide. So we start with xt minus two minus its conditional expectation. We then use the fact that the time t 
t, the time t of xt forecast of xt plus 2 is the same as the time t forecast of xt plus 1. I then expand what that forecast is. So it's xt minus 1 minus alpha epsilon t. That comes from the integrated moving average approach. We then need to substitute in for what xt plus 2 is. So we do that. and We can see we have that expression here. That is this entire expression here is just the model version of what xt plus 2 is. So it depends on xt plus 1 and, of course, the two previous shocks. We then have subtracted the forecast, which is the second value in that line. We then, of course, have one more substitution we need to do. We need to substitute for xt plus 1 to bring everything back to xt. So this very first expression here, this is the substitution of xt plus 1 for its model. And we can see that's going to give us some terms we can cancel. In particular, we'll see that the xt and the 1 minus alpha epsilon t will cancel with our forecast. So it's going to leave us with a few things left over. In particular, we're going to have a epsilon t plus 1, epsilon t plus 1 there, and epsilon t plus 2. We're going to be able to do some, some simplification in terms of the term leading epsilon t plus 1, because here we have a plus 1. There I have a minus 1, and ultimately I'm going to have a plus alpha. So the plus 1 and minus 1 will cancel, and that's going to leave me simply with alpha epsilon t plus 1 plus epsilon t plus 2. If you're going to continue this forward, the next term in the sequence, would so you'd end up with alpha epsilon t plus 1. You then would end up with alpha epsilon t plus 2. And finally, you'd have epsilon t plus 3. So in fact, every term, except for the very last one, will always have an alpha from it. And that simply comes from the fact that we have a moving average with a parameter negative 1 minus alpha. That's just a sort of convenience that comes out of this. And so applying that, we can actually apply that generally to see the forecast error for any horizon is going to be the, the final forecast error plus the sum of alpha times all of the previous forecast errors from 1 to h minus 1. So when we actually want to compute the variance of this sum, we assume the epsilons are white noise, so they're uncorrelated. We sort of make another assumption that the variance is constant for simplicity. And so, of course, then we're just going to get the sum of the variances with some weights. So in other words, I'm going to get sigma squared from the first term. Then I'm going to get alpha squared sigma squared plus alpha squared sigma squared and so on plus alpha squared sigma squared for the remaining terms. We're going to have exactly h minus 1 of those. And when we take that back to the previous slide, what we can see here is that, of course, there's my h minus 1 alpha squared. There's my 1 that comes from that. And of course, my sigma squared is not there because it's been pulled out of the, the square root. But as soon as I put that back in, you'd have the exact same expression we have on the next slide. So prediction intervals are also fairly simple. They only depend on one additional parameter, which is sigma squared or sigma, which can be estimated along with the model parameters. To sum up, simple exponential smoothing is the same as what we know as an exponentially weighted moving average. It has a really simple forecasting pattern. That is, you make the one step ahead forecast, and then you have the forecast for all horizons. The model itself depends on two parameters, alpha, which is the smoothing parameter, and x1 given 0, which we often call the initial value. We almost always have to estimate alpha. Of course, in the volatility modeling context, we assumed the alpha based on a sort of historical study. But with, with real data, you would want to estimate alpha. And there's always a question of whether you want to estimate x1 given 0 or simply make your life simple and just set it, which is a common choice, just set this value equal to x1. Again, as long as t is moderately, moderately large and alpha is not extremely close to 1, this value is not going to play a large role in the forecast of xt plus 1 or, or any horizon. These are estimated by least squares when you do want to estimate it. And we saw that ultimately, when we do simple exponential smoothing, what we're doing is we're actually generating optimal forecasts for the model that is an integrated moving average 1, that is a first-order integrated moving average.